coming at you from the revolution of one. What's happening? Hey, we here to talk about. <laughs> we here to talk about my religion, my life philosophy, my inspiration, my everything as a shy town boy representing representing my Bulls dynasty, greatest team to ever play the game. We had to talk about the last dance, the last dance. I'm assuming if uh, if y'all following us on Instagram that y'all at least know what the last dance is. But Kamal, you want to give the people, give the good people a primer? Yes, the last dance is a 10 part uh, documentary that is now streaming on ESPN. And it is about the untold story of Michael Jordan um, the now renowned sports god and his battle with the titans of his era. So those include the Detroit Pistons, those include uh, the Boston Celtics, and um, and then the internal battles that he had to deal with with the Bulls organization and all the uh, just all the the I don't even know what to call it like the scheming, the planning, the the yeah. uh, the all the beautiful things of business. So one, one of the things that's that's pretty special about the way this documentary was made was it's not just people talking to the Bulls now, reflecting back on the memories and then using some old footage from the games. In their final season together, when they on their quest for their second three-peat, they gave a film crew permission to follow them around yeah. that whole season and get never before seen footage from the locker room, from the games, from the post conferences and the, you know, like the gym and all kinds of stuff like that. So if you're an NBA fan, if you're a sports fan, you're a fan of greatness, you're a fan of Jordan and the Bulls, you get a chance to hear some cool stories or hear some commentary around familiar stories that makes it extra exciting. So, hey, we just want to kind of riff about it for a little bit. I know we, I know we titled this Last Dance Life Lessons. And we just kind of wanted to to kick it off just talking about some observations from it that stuck out to us as a source of inspiration or maybe cautionary wisdom. Kamal, I'm going to let you go first, man. What's one thing when you were watching this? We, let's limit it to just the first two episodes right now. What's sure. one thing when you were watching this that really jumped out at you, man, as a point of inspiration or just something that prompted you to think? Well, I, I think the first two episodes, they really covered, um, you know, why Michael Jordan was special. I think a lot of people know generally because, again, he is a sports god. Um, but people don't understand, like, how did he ascend to that, you know, that, 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 that place that he's at right now, you know, that, that throne that he sends at. And, you know, even I, I grew up in kind of um, in, like, the, the 90s, and so I – I really didn't get to see Jordan really in full fledged mode. Like I, um, I was just like a little kid at that time. So in the early two thousands, I think that's when I started paying attention. And that was the era of Kobe, which then transitioned into LeBron. Um, and I, I never really knew why Michael Jordan was, you know, as great as he, you know, like how did he get there? And I think, um, you know, watching him, just go through the battles that he went through in his house um, with his family, with his dad, with his brother, um, and just how, you know, he had a battle at, you know, in the household for love, essentially, for approval from his dad. And that that just, um, that eat or be eaten mindset that he he carries just with him started, started at home. And I, I kind of had these feelings about him, that that's a environment to grow up in, right? Um, where you're fighting for love. What, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, man. I mean, uh, you know, he talked about him and his brother, uh, Larry. They would get into fist fights, you know, yeah. when they would play a game of basketball. And he was saying there's just something about fighting somebody that you love so much that just really kind of <laughs> changes you in a lot of ways, right? Well, you know, it's funny, man, because, I, I, you know, talking about this competitiveness, I ruffled a few feathers on Twitter today because I, I, I put up a tweet that says something like, NBA players today, winning championships isn't everything. Michael Jordan, accumulating stats, winning regular season games and awards doesn't mean anything unless I win championships. And I think you can't talk about Michael's greatness without talking about the fact that for him, he was motivated by winning. Like you contrast that with guys like Dwight Howard to some extent, even LeBron, where it's sort of like, I, I love doing what I love. I love being with the guys. I love being buddy-buddy with everybody. 
I love us all hanging out and having a good time. And if we don't win championships, that's fine. You know, I, I got triple devils. I, I got MVPs. I got defensive players of the year. Like, you know, there's more to life than winning. And you could say what you want, but Mike was who he was because he actually boiled it down to winning. And every chance he got, he would hold it up as the standard. They, they were the first team to win 70 games in the season. He said, doesn't mean a thing without the ring. You know what I mean? Like they, they beat a team in the regular season by 20 points. And he would say, those are just stats. Those are accolades. Doesn't mean anything without a title. He get an MVP award, make the all-star team. That's individual greatness. I want to be up there with Magic and Larry and I want to win titles. And I think that's just a rare mindset. And, and going back to his upbringing, that's, that came from that work ethic that his father instilled in him. Like one of the things his father talked about was when I saw my sons kind of coasting and becoming comfortable with the level of mastery they were at, I made sure I pushed them to, to go further and realize their potential. And like Jordan had that mentality. He could, he could have settled at so many levels, but he always said, I want to push higher, man. What I found interesting um, was his almost disregard for um, for like what is safe, what is uh, appropriate. Like he, he, the way he would speak about the Bulls front office, the way he would speak about the general manager, like to the press, like not, you know, in a closed room, but to the press, to the fans. And and he would call them out. He was like, you know, you, you guys aren't on the court playing, playing the games. You guys aren't. Uh, going to battle with these teams, you're not going to bring a championship home. And like, yeah. you'll never hear Steph Curry say that. You'll never hear LeBron say that. Um, and 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 that's just crazy to me. That 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 just I must win mindset did not stop with just his teammates. It didn't stop with just the people on the court. Like <laughs> his disregard for like what's acceptable as a player. Like I think. Um, you know, certain execs might feel like, you know, he didn't know his place. I think, you know, this whole thing about LeBron more than an athlete, I think Jordan just didn't respect those boundaries. Like he didn't care that he was just a player. He knew how, how much he was valuable and, and how much the Bulls needed him, but he did not care about politics. He was just very out there with what he believed and, and he didn't have a problem calling people on it. Yeah, and, and I look at that as just like being comfortable with yourself too, you know what I mean? Um, there, There's no right or wrong about how you wanna carry yourself. You know, there's no single correct way to be a human being, but that Jordan way is a way that a lot of people are afraid of. If, if you disagree yeah. with your boss, aren't you supposed <sighs> to just kind of smile and pretend like you do agree and say the politically yeah. correct thing? But but MJ was the kind of cat that'd be like, I don't think that was the best decision, but whatever, we got to make the most of it, you know? Uh, yeah. And that level of comfort with himself, I, I think that's more than a personality quirk. I think that's part of what contributed to to his greatness. But, you know, I, I want to talk about another thing too, man, I thought was interesting. And, and, and this is a segue from what you said about him being willing to disagree with his leaders on his team. The Chicago Bulls, man, for all they accomplished, there was a lot of conflict on that team. And yeah. I think in a lot of business management philosophy, organizational philosophy, people talk as if the way to win is to make sure you create this space where everybody feels like part of the family. And I think as an ideal, you should strive to create a space that feels amicable. You should never say, let's create an environment where everybody's fighting all the time so we can be like the bulls. But Reality is there are always going to be issues, man. There are always going to be people that don't like each other. There are always going to be people that don't see eye to eye. There are always going to be people that feel like they're forced to do something they don't want to do or forced to compensate for somebody else's slacking. And the Bulls had all of that element, all of those elements. If you feel like you're part of a job or organization where there's conflict and tension, that Bulls dynasty had every aspect of it. And they were great, not because they didn't have those issues. They were great because they said, let's come together when it counts and let's figure out a way to create something special. None of us are grabbing beers with each other or coffee with each other. None of us are hanging out with each other after the game, but let's come together and crush it so we can be remembered forever. I love that. You know, something that come that that 
that I think about from that though, you know, what's different in that scenario, I feel like is, you know, they're performers. They played in front of fans. People got to witness their greatness live, you know, on broadcast. It's, it was undeniable. Whereas, you know, maybe if you work in an office or in a team, um, mm. depending on your position, your upper management can shut you down. You know, they, they can crush the light on your candle and, ju and just put you out, right? Um, you don't have an audience to witness the things you're doing. You don't have um, the fan base to argue for you. And, and it's hard to almost know your value when you don't have that stuff, right? When you don't have that external validation. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Whereas like, you know, these are performers and, and they have witnesses, whereas people, mm. you know, in an organization might feel uh, not as in control or not as powerful. So that difference is definitely there, but I kind of want to play devil's advocate with that because you had a lot of stubbornness in Bulls management that rendered the opinions of the masses completely irrelevant. I'll give you two examples. One, at the beginning of that last dance season, Jerry Cross, who was determined to rebuild, determined to rebuild. Like, I mean, I don't know if this guy just thought it was easier than it was to put together a championship team. But Jordan had already made it clear that he wasn't going to play for any other coach besides Phil Jackson. Everybody knew that if Phil doesn't come back, that Bulls team is dismantled. Krause, at the beginning of the season, makes it known this is Phil Jackson's last year. Calls Phil Jackson into the office and lets him know, we're going to go ahead and sign you a contract and take good care of you financially, but this is it. Like, I don't care if you win 82 games, you're not coming back. And you can hear the crowd sometimes booing. Jerry Krause, who's the GM of the Bulls, and he didn't care. I mean, he might have cared emotionally, but it didn't affect what he did. He still made it It feels last season, and he kept his word on that. Or you take Scotty's contract. I remember, I remember living through that and seeing the bitterness in Scotty as, you know, as he felt underpaid and underappreciated. And I remember Jerry Krause refusing to renegotiate his contract and salivating over Tony Kukoc, right? Like spending all this effort to like go out and get Tony Kukoc from Croatia while Scotty's just live it back home. And Kraus, he, he never said, look, I got like the second best player in the NBA. I should at least make him happy. I know technically I got him on a contract, but I should at least renegotiate, give him some kind of bump so we can focus on the season. Nah, Kraus was like, I don't care if the crowd boos me. I don't care if people are mad and people on sports commentary, they were saying it all the time. Like this probably would go away if they renegotiate that contract and Krause was stubborn. So to me, he represents that possibility we've all experienced, which is you've got a leader or an influencer in your life who it doesn't matter what the crowd thinks, how much you or anybody else dislikes them. They're stubborn. They're going to do what they want to do and you're going to have to deal with it. And they still had to find a way to focus and win in spite of those things. To me, that's inspiring, man. And, and, and yeah, there's always some differences, but there's still something there to take from it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let me ask you what, you know, as you were kind of watching, because I know you grew up a fan and, and, and you were you were there, you were watching the games as, you know, they were going through championship after championship. How much do you think luck played into Michael Jordan's career i mean obviously um in, in in the whole you know saying about um opportunity or preparedness versus opportunity equals luck or some some kind of formulation of that um yeah. what how do you think luck played into michael jordan's uh success oh man i think in every nba career you look at winners and losers are, are alike luck and bad luck play some kind of role and timing is everything, man. Timing is everything. And you can have a great player with a few hiccups in timing that can make things exceptionally hard. It, it, it could maybe cost you an, a championship or two. I mean, just to deviate for a minute, I remember when, when the Lakers, during Kobe's prime, pulled off that amazing trade and they were able to get uh, Chris Paul to come over to the Lakers. And then what did the NBA do? They veto that trade. And so many people believe, as I do, that the Lakers would have been a lock 
for six championships. Like Kobe would have got his sixth ring if he would have went into that season with Chris Paul. But they vetoed it, right? And so Kobe had to spend a couple of more years prior to his injury just not having the team that was the, the greatest fit for him. So I think luck does play a big role. I'm against using luck as, as a dismissive thing, though, to say, oh, he only won because he's lucky. It's both of those things. It's preparation plus opportunity. Nobody was a harder worker than Jordan. And the only person who even belongs in that discussion is Kobe Bryant. I'm not talking about the greatest citizen, the most politically involved, the most charming and the most likable, the most well-rounded and statistically successful in terms of like having the killer instinct, being a workaholic, being obsessive, always working on elements of your game. Nobody is anywhere near that discussion other than Kobe. And everything that Mike achieved, as much as luck could have assisted him, there are a lot of people who who could have been in the midst of that luck and wouldn't have achieved what he what he achieved because the brother was prepared, man. And, and he's an inspiration to everybody for how much more you can accomplish, whether that's like inner peace or, or outer wealth, if you push yourself to get to that next level, if you look at your weaknesses and say, I don't accept these weaknesses as final, there's something I can do to refine this area of my game. I, I think that has more to do with his success than anything else, you know? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, this concept of obsessiveness, it plays such a, such a huge role. And I think, um, you know, as an audience member, as a fan, right? Like I watched Kobe, you could see the obsessiveness. You could see it in his face. And and I think like there's just different levels of that. You know, some people just cultivate that to be, to just be so, so, so powerful that your mindset is just dead set on this and you're going to give your life to achieve this before anything else, right? Before anything else happens. I, I think those people who are obsessive don't second guess what they're obsessed about. They don't second guess whether it's going to happen or not. They just go. And I think, I think you know, there's other NBA players who have the same genes of greatness, right? Um, who have the same physical abilities, right? Um, who have like the passing, who have the shooting, who who have all the fundamental. It, it's it, you know, it's that it's that question in the back of their mind, that pending doubt. Whereas somebody who's obsessed you know, there, there's no boundaries. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're the owner of the team. It doesn't matter if you're a ball boy. It doesn't matter if you're a ref or that you are, you know, the, the commissioner of the league. Like, obsessed is obsessed. And I'm going to get it no matter what. That's that's a mindset, like you said, that that only very few have possessed. Yeah, and, and, and a critical aspect of that was just how unapologetic he was about the kind of success that he wanted. I mean, can you imagine saying something like, I want, I just wanna win championships today? Or, or, or even take something similar today by just saying, I wanna be rich, I wanna have a lot of money. That's not, that's not really politically correct. You know, That's not gonna sell as well as saying, I don't really care about money, I just wanna live a meaningful life. That will sell. Everybody will love you for saying that. Like nobody can be mad at you for that. If you say something like, you know what? I value having material wealth and I want to be a billionaire, a lot of people aren't going to like you for that. And they're going to look at you as, as if you're missing the point of life for that. And maybe you are, maybe you aren't. But the beauty of being an individual is that you get to decide what success is to you. And in a world where so many people are trying to make us apologize about the kind of success we want, Jordan refused to apologize about that. Well, uh, one of my favorite moments, I think it was Roy Williams who said, Jordan told him, I want to be the best basketball player of all time. And he said, well, you're going to have to work a lot harder than you used to. And he says, I work yeah. just as hard as everybody else. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you told me you wanted to be the best of all time. And he said, after that, that just got into Jordan and fired him up. And he was always the first guy at the gym, always the last guy to leave the gym. And he, and he always admitted that he wanted it. He didn't say, I don't really care about being the best. I just want to do this thing that I love. Like he owned it. I want to be the best. He would say things like, I need to win more championships than Larry Bird. I need to win more championships than Magic. When, when he reached two championships and they said, do you want to go for a three-peat? He says, yeah, that's something that Larry and Magic were never able to accomplish. I want to be able to do something that they couldn't do. I mean, he held that up as a standard before he hit it. 
I mean, he framed his whole situation to be seen as a failure if he didn't hit that because he was driven by that and he owned his concept of greatness so so thoroughly. As you can see, I'm fired up, man. Something that you know that I've actually heard you say before, and and I might be pulling it out of context, is is just to kind of be cautious about um, setting expectations for other people, like like setting your saying your goals out loud and 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 letting everybody know what exactly you're trying to do. So how do you kind of, you know, how do you view that in, in, in Jordan's, uh, in Jordan's like, in Jordan's career? Because that that's something that I agree with. It's not politically correct. It's really bold. It can come off as arrogant. It can come off as all these things. And then if you don't hit it, you know, you look like a fool. So I've heard, you know, we've talked about, you know, in those goals, like setting them high, but not, not you know blasting them on the front uh page of the news how do you kind of feel about that because michael did do that michael said yes i'm for six yes i want to be the best basketball player yeah and i don't and what you think is realistic or what is not yeah i love it man well you, you know for me the mother of all advice is that any form of advice is capable of making your life worse if you don't think critically and creatively about how you apply it to your life, right? Um, that there's nothing that works for everybody all the time, no matter how they use it. There's always a variable and you got to be creative. You got to think critically in how you're going to use that piece of advice. So I like, I like to take a both and approach. Everything that you do, there's a context where it works. There's a context where it doesn't work. And what's your situation? So I give you an example from basketball. We've seen this in many cases where sometimes a coach will deliberately get a technical foul by arguing with the referee to get himself kicked out of the game to fire his teammates up. I mean, to fire his his uh, his team up, yeah. right? Now, in general, that's not a good thing to do. You don't want to argue with the ref and get kicked out of the game. That's kind of stupid or irresponsible or short-sighted. But sometimes as a strategy, that can be a brilliant move to make. And so I think... When you're a follower or you're a student or you're new at something and you're trying to discover where you are, you're not really sure if you're committed to something, you're kind of conducting a, an experiment, but you're not fully dedicated. It's it's useful to not over promise. It's useful to under promise and then over deliver because deliver, you don't really know what you want, right? You're not even sure if this is something that you're willing to commit to. It might be the type of thing that three weeks in when you get bored, you might quit. And so you want to make sure you don't set yourself up to be seen as a flake. But sometimes when you're a leader and you know you're fully invested, you know this is what you want to do, and you've made your peace that you're going to do whatever it takes to win at this goal, you've got to speak and conduct yourself in a way that's going to motivate your team and get them fired up. And when, when the leader of a team is talking to the reporters, you know, there's no time and place to be saying, well, I don't know because my teammates have never won before. I don't know because I'm not sure if I trust my teammates. I can win, but these guys over here, I don't know. It's going to be really, really hard. You want your leader to say, I believe in my team. I think we can beat anybody. I'll take my four guys against any other five any day of the week because these guys got heart. And you know what? We're going for the championship because you want to cultivate that winning mentality in your teammates who don't have the ambition that you have. And the way Jordan did it, he did it in a way that motivated him. He did it in a way that motivated his teammates. And so you kind of got to look at it for you in that way. There are some people that doesn't motivate them. If setting a high bar makes you stress out all the time and it makes you lose sleep and it makes you resent your goals, then don't do that. Just keep it to yourself and let your actions do the talking. But if you're the kind of person who gets excited by risk and it makes you work harder to know that people are going to call you out if you predict something and it don't come true, then that that's a tool that's there for you to use, you know? Yeah. One, one thing I wanted yeah. to touch off, touch on while we're on the subject of Michael Jordan is um, that book that, um, that his trainer wrote, um, Tim Grover. Uh, uh, I think Relentless. the book is called. Yep. And something that really, that I connected with from that book is this concept of the dark side of having this, this part of you that you can go to and you can just, become that inner beast and when when you know you hear stories of when kobe was on the court you hear stories when jordan was on the court 
And the guys are like, oh, man, like we done made him mad now. Like and they can see that beast just just, you know, it's coming out of its cage. How do you think that transfers to, you know, day to day when you're, you know, you're in business or you're an employee? Like, how do you kind of um, how do you step into that beast and, and, and just go hard, but in a professional way? Yeah. So, so I have some thoughts on that, but I, I want to hear what you think about that. I think it's hard. I think like yeah. the, the, the talk, uh, in the inner voice, um, that I have is, is in, in a lot of times, like if I'm entering a work day or if I'm entering a super intense project or whatever, if my name is on the line, then I'm going to go to war for my name. I'm going to go to war to prove that my name carries weight and that the stuff I deliver, um, I, I will never be ashamed of it, that I've given it everything I got. Um, and I, I think that, you know, when you're working and doing individual work, right, it, it's a lot easier to possess that mindset because you have complete control over things. But when you're working with a team or you're working with a staff or, you know, you're working around like society and, and, and what's safe, that's a lot harder to, to step into that beast mode. I think, you know, in, yeah. on a court, um, it's a court, like it, this is, this is, yes, it's a game, but at the same time, like it's, it's a war ground. Um, and that's, that's just, to me, it's harder to translate that, um, into, into like things that aren't sports. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that. And I, I agree, you know, for me, I, I, I don't, I don't know if there's some like clear definition for dark side, but here's how I understand, you know, that concept, particularly as we see it in sports, like with Jordan and Kobe, I see the dark, I see activating your dark side, not as, you know, becoming, you know, an evil villain, but rather as liberating yourself from an addiction to the good guy complex. You know, um, yes. the good guy complex is when your your fulfillment is based on other people thinking that you're awesome, right? He's such a good guy. I really like him. Everybody likes him. He's so nice, man. He's such a good guy. That feels good when everybody thinks you're a good guy. But sometimes in order to do things that are beautiful, you got to be willing to look ugly, right? It's like when you go to the gym and you exercise, you don't get to look cute if you want to get something out of that exercise. You got to look sloppy. You got to look out of shape. You got to look ugly. You got to be willing to put your body in a space where this is not time for the cute Instagram photo. It's time for the <laughs> looking like you about to die, right? That's what it's going to take for you to look beautiful. It's the same way with art. It's the same way with sports. It's the same way with work. If you want to develop your skills to the point where you can create something beautiful, you got to be willing to let go of a preoccupation you have where everybody thinking that you're cute, everybody thinking that you're nice. I know sometimes in order for me to get things done, I got to let the people around me know, all right, I got to hammer down, right? I got to hammer down. I love all of y'all, but this ain't the time for me to give, it, give out any hugs. This ain't the time for me to kiss anybody. This ain't the time for me to tell anybody I love you too. Like I have to hammer down game seven mentality with a sense of urgency. If, if, if the house is on fire and it's your responsibility to put the fire out, that's just not the time to be giving somebody a hug, right? That's not the time to, to figure out what is the best way to tell somebody that they need to get the hell up out of here, right? That's just not the time. And there's a time and a place for being super diplomatic and nice and PC. And there's a time and a place to just be real and let people know the truth. And so I, I, look in, I look at the dark side as being, the way I put it is, as I say, don't be a jerk, but don't be afraid to be seen as a jerk. You know what I mean? Like treat people with respect, treat people kindly, be generous towards other people, but also understand that in order to be a leader and make good decisions, you're going to have to live with the fact that some people are going to look at the decisions that you make and say, I don't like that. You're not nice, nice anymore. You know, my, my uh, one, one of my nephews is like that where like he'll ask you for a piece of candy. And if you say, no, I don't like you, you're mean, <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, if you believe in the decision, if you believe in your no, you've got to be willing to put up with that. And that can hurt. And that game gets played at the adult level too. at your job. There are going to be people 
that give you a, an intellectually sophisticated version of, I don't like you, you're mean because you didn't give me what I want, but sometimes that's the right decision. Or, or, or another example of that, nearly everybody that is a, is a master of their craft talks about the importance of time management. And they talk about the key to that as, as saying no, right? You can't say yes to everybody's request on you. There's an infinite number of birthday parties, an infinite number of, of movie outings and coffee meetups and things like that. And if, and if you wanna fulfill your purpose in life or, or do something that you need to get done, you're gonna have to say no. And everybody ain't gonna understand that no. Some people gonna be mad about that. And activating the dark side is, is, is being willing to say, in order to have the legacy that fits with my definition of success, I'm, I'm willing to be the bad guy of somebody else's story so that I can be the hero of my own. I'm not gonna be the bad guy according to my moral principles, but I'm willing to be disliked in order to make the kind of difference that I wanna make, you know? I think that's what that's all about. And, and, and that's, yeah. It seemed like Jordan didn't have to necessarily like make that sacrifice. Like it seems like the media, you know, praised him as well, right? They 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 put him as um, you know the David going against the Goliaths, going against you know Detroit and the Bad Boy Pistons, um, and he was always seen as kind of the hero. But if you talk to players, like Jordan was a dog. How do you think like he struck that balance versus um, you know in the current NBA like Kobe was hated, hated. So like, what's the difference? Yeah. So. I actually think it's the opposite. I think Kobe is the guy that initially had it easy and had to learn it. What, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I, okay, okay. So, so, so really quickly, if you look at Kobe's career, he was the golden boy from the moment that he came in the league. He was good looking, charming, clean cut, spoke like five or six languages, well cultured. Everybody loved Kobe. It, it wasn't until around the time that Shaq left LA and everybody kind of blamed him for that. And, and, and he had his legal issue. It wasn't until then that, that Kobe had to learn what to do when you're no longer the golden boy and the majority of people are booing you and hating on you. And, and by the way, even though a lot of people in LA might pretend like they never had a moment where they deviated from Kobe, I definitely remember lots of hate coming from LA when Shaq left the Lakers because people blamed Kobe for that. And he had to learn what to do when you're not getting that love that he was accustomed to. Now, I actually think Jordan did get a lot of that as well. So for instance, um, in his first All-Star game, he had what you know the freeze out game where a, a lot of the players on the team, they, they kind of wanted to initiate the rookie and they froze him out by not giving him the ball. And he didn't understand what was going on, but when he found out, that really hurt his feelings. And, and Jordan was very vulnerable about that. He said that hurt his feelings, that up until that point, he was kind of a little, a little naive, right? He was like, hey, guys, what's going on? He was a little naive. Um, he talked about when he was a rookie on, like, the first day. You know, he was looking for his other teammates, and he knocked on a, on a, he kept knocking on doors, and he got to one door, and it was like, shh, who is it? And he was like, it's Michael, it's Michael Jordan. And they were like, oh, he's just a rookie, let him in. And he came in and he saw the guys doing drugs and all that kind of stuff. And he had to be like, ah, I don't want to be involved in this because this is going to lead me down a wrong path. Like there was pushback from that. Like you can't make that kind of decision without other guys being like, ah, oh, man, this guy, goody two shoes. This guy's a square. Oh, this guy thinks he's better than us. Even the media dug into his gambling thing. Um, I remember going into their three-peat uh, their their third their third championship was won against the Phoenix Suns. Prior to them making it to like one of the final games, Jordan stopped talking to the media. He was very upset. Stopped talking to the media because they just kept getting on him about staying up late, going to the casinos, saying nasty things about him, about him getting into his personal life. So he knew what it was like to go from being "We love you, we love you." to gossiping about you. And I think he had to learn how to cope with that experience of not always being the good guy, that people will ask you for an autograph and they'll love you, but then they'll also talk smack about you behind your back. They'll also freeze you out in the All-Star game. They'll, they'll you know, stab your back in a lot of ways. 
And I think he had to learn to toughen up as well, because that's not something that he experienced quite like that when he was just at the University of North Carolina. I, I think everybody has to learn it in their own way. Mike, Mike is certainly no exception. So give me your top two life lessons from, from watching Michael Jordan's career. Career, just not limited to life, uh, last dance. That number one, um, there's a big difference between being first and being the best. Um, Michael Jordan didn't make his high school team the first time he tried out, but he eventually became the best. He wasn't the first pick in the NBA draft. He wasn't the second pick in the NBA draft. He was the third pick in the NBA draft. Just because you aren't the world's first choice for who's most likely to succeed don't mean you aren't actually the most likely to succeed. Just because you aren't the first one to get your idea out there doesn't mean that your idea can't be the best. Being first ain't necessarily the same as being the best. The, the second thing is you don't owe anybody an apology for how you define success. If you want to define it as something that ain't got nothing to do with money, that's your privilege, that's your prerogative. If you want to define it as something that does have something to do with money, that's your privilege and that's your prerogative. You know, as long as you're willing to be honest with yourself and take ownership of what you got to do to get there, you don't owe anybody any apology for how you want to pursue success. Because at the end of the day, no matter what you do, it's going to be somebody that's going to hate on it and de delegitimize your particular form of winning. Hello, Kevin Durant two finals MVPs, back-to-back -back trips to the finals, and half the NBA dismisses that as illegitimate because he joined a 70-win team. Hello, LeBron James. You know, you've been in the finals, what, like seven years straight? You've won, you know, like one for Cleveland, two for Miami, and it's people that dismiss that as legitimate because each time you joined up with two independently established All-Stars, there's nobody that doesn't have anybody out there saying, I refuse to respect your form of winning. So you just got to decide what winning is for you and not apologize for it. Absolutely. Hey man, let's, let's, let's what, what about you, man? What's, what's, what's your top two? Um, I think number one is by, by staying true to yourself, to your intuition, to that inner voice. Um, I think you, you set the path for so many other people, right? You, you prove what's possible. Um, every NBA player who plays in the league now watched Michael Jordan. And that and that and his play, the way he played the game, the way he changed things by staying true to himself, by staying true to his work ethic, by staying present in the moment and giving it everything he freaking had. Um, he, he touched every single life of all the current players by seeing what was possible, by seeing somebody push the boundaries um, and, and and just set an entire new like um era of basketball an era of player um so i think you know as long as you're staying true to yourself as long as you know you're fulfilling that inner drive that inner bucket um you're gonna touch so many lives of others you're gonna you're gonna change the culture in a way that you can't really plan as long as you're staying on track um and listening to that inner voice you're gonna influence others um and hopefully in a positive way. I think secondly, um, that's what gets a good just one. not be afraid to, to get the people around you to rise, you know, to, to rise to the level, to, to rise to their full potential and, and not being afraid of the truth. I think to, to be that kind of late leader, like, yes, you have extreme ownership. Yes. Um, you know, you're going to put the team on your back, but you're also not going to let the people on your team take it easy on themselves. You're going to ask them to go to dance this dance with you. And you're going to ask them to give, uh, you're going to ask them to give you everything that they got. And you're not going to be afraid to ask them whether that's the ownership, whether that's, you know, your coach, um, you know, you're, you're going to elevate everybody. And I, I think not being afraid of that. So many people, including myself and in, in sometimes, are afraid of that, are afraid of, you know, being being truthful, calling people on their stuff and and really asking them to rise to the occasion and being unforgiving if they're not. I think a lot of great leaders, including Kobe, which is, you know, him and Shaq talk a lot about that and how if Shaq would have just just rose, he could have been the the best player ever. Um, and I think, you know, the, the leaders who really build um, 
movements and, and who really mobilize things and, and win championships. Um, they get the people around them to elevate to a level that they probably wouldn't have done without somebody pushing them. Yeah, yeah. Word to the wise, man. We, we, we should run this back. You know, I know we talked about episodes one and two and then, you know, some 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 peripheral things, but we should run it back and, and talk about three and four. So let's let's make sure we we get caught up and uh and we we'll dive back into it. Sweet, man. Let's do it. All right, bro.